On October 3rd, the Delhi police raided journalists, editors, consultants who've been associated in some way or the other with the online news portal NewsClick and subsequently charged two people under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, thereby primarily accusing journalists of terrorism. Alarm on this was raised by at least 18 press organizations who wrote to the Chief Justice of India asking for safeguards. They have stated within point one of the joint letter for the framing of norms to discourage the seizure of journalists' phones and laptops on a web. Welcome to Amaltas Talks. Today I will be dealing with how the seizure of personal computing devices such as smartphones, tablets, laptops is part of a wider trend in which our policing authorities are seizing them under questionable legal powers and even compelling people to unlock them. This video is specifically in the context of journalists and how media freedoms are threatened in India today. This video is broken into three parts, where I first look at the broader trend of media repression in India and the role of device seizures. Secondly, I look at how the criminal justice system has gaps which allow the investigating and police authorities to seize these devices in a disproportionate manner. And third is where I look at how safeguards may be evolved through judicial action to prevent such abuses. So let us start. This repressive environment for journalists is evidenced from the World Press Freedom Index, where India stands at 161 out of 180 countries. This index considers legal interference in journalism as one of the factors to determine the act. What this essentially means is that whenever tax actions, criminal investigations and civil proceedings are used by those in power, those in public office, to prevent journalists from reporting, it constitutes a drop in press freedom. Now you may remember, this year itself on February 13, the Income Tax Department carried out a multi-day raid, or as it technically called it, a survey action on the offices of the British Broadcasting Corporation in New Delhi and Bombay. And after continuing this survey for three days, a press release was issued by the Central Board of Direct Taxes, citing an alleged evasion of taxes on remittances by BBC India. This shortly came after the Modi documentary was broadcast globally, but not in India. Here, here questions arose as to the timing of this tax survey and whether this was in retaliation as an attack against press freedom. The survey action on the BBC fits within a broader pattern of data, which has been crunched by Tanishka Sothi from News Laundry, who has revealed as of May 2023, at least 44 media entities and journalists have faced scrutiny from investigative and tax agencies over the past five years. Here, the seizure of digital devices of journalists is an essential component of such raids and investigations. My own research has shown since 2018, at least 10 reported instances of device searches. Now, this includes the online news publication, The Quint, but also includes the proprietors and senior editors of publications such as Bharat Samachar, Denny Bhaskar, News Click, The Wire, Independent and Public Spirited Media Foundation, which funds a lot of these digital news media startups, or even individual journalists such as Fahad Shah, who's right now in custody, Rupesh Kumar Singh and Siddiq Kapan. Now, you may be wondering what happens in a seizure. Let us walk back to what happened with the BBC. The Central Board of Direct Taxes issued a press release after its survey action in which it stated that it gathered crucial evidences by way of statement of employees, digital evidence and documents. The BBC explained it in greater detail by putting out a statement. It stated that journalists' computers were searched, their phones were intercepted and information was sought from them about their working methods. Now, we must ask ourselves that even if this case of tax evasion is credible, it should be limited to the seizure of data which relates to accounting or it should be a financial investigation. Why take away the phones from reporters and anchors of the BBC? This fits within a wider trend where the first thing an investigating agency does is that it takes away the smartphone of a journalist. This trend can only be disputed on the basis of official data, which is not only unavailable, but the Home Ministry refuses to gather it. In a parliamentary response, the Ministry of Home Affairs has stated that since police and law and order are subjects within the competence of state governments, it cannot centrally maintain data on the number of device seizures of journalists. This is a half-truth for two reasons. The first is that the Crime in India report is published or should be published every year by the Ministry of Home Affairs, in which they ask different state governments to tell them about the kinds of FIRs which have been registered under different provisions of criminal law. Second, many of the search and seizures which have been done by agencies such as the Income Tax Department or even the Delhi Police in the instance of News Click report to the Union Government. These departments come under the jurisdiction of either the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Home Affairs, for instance, the Delhi Police, which reports to the Ministry of Home Affairs. So at least it does have some data in which central agencies who are acting under the directions of the union government can report data to it. However, it refuses to gather and then publish this. 
This institutional evasion only increases suspicion about the bona fides of these prosecutions and also represents a lack of intent for any studied consideration by the executive, particularly the union government, with respect to the threat against media freedoms today. Now we have established the trend. Let us see what makes it possible. Which brings me to part two of this video. Why is the police able to seize these smartphones from journalists for the asking? In the age of instant messaging and cloud storage, the code of criminal procedure remains rooted in the time of telegraphs and wooden chests and guides our criminal justice process. This approach not only ignores the invasiveness of modern technologies which gather each bit of our data constantly, but also struggles to uphold the democratic rights within the constitution of India. Chapter 8 of the CRPC houses the essence of the search and seizure powers. It outlines provisions for voluntary document submission based on notices or police actions based on properly obtained warrants. However, this is rarely practiced. Let's just look at section 91 to understand the problem, which allows for the production of any document or anything considered necessary or desirable for the purpose of any investigation, inquiry, trial or other proceeding. Advocate S. Prasanna states that the section lacks specificity and it can even mean that an accused is compelled to produce their phone which may contain hundreds of documents rather than an individual piece of evidence which may link to an investigation. He has explained this in great detail in a recent article which is authored, which I have linked to in this video, and is also the lawyer in the PIL of Ram Ramaswamy, that is a petition which is asking for safeguards to be laid down by the Supreme Court of India. In the absence of these safeguards, the day-to-day -day experience of most Indians whenever they face any kind of law enforcement is that there is no prior judicial warrant for the police to conduct searches or to ask whether there is a seizure of their phone and these are mere formalities and like many formalities, they are rarely respected. Most people even willingly comply with law enforcement demands without warrants, fearing heightened risks such as physical assaults or prosecution under an unrelated charge. And this is evidenced by the Luok Niti CSDS Common Cause Report, Policing in India 2023, which reveals that 47% of Indians believe that police can access their phones without their consent. Here, people may also be wondering whether the courts will act as defenders of the liberty of citizens and enroachments by the police will be checked by them. However, according to legal academics and trial court practitioners who honestly assess the role of the courts, there is only disappointment. The underlying institutional culture, as noted by lawyer Abhinav Sekri, is rooted in a colonial mentality of maximizing state interests of prosecution while depriving any semblance of protection to the accused persons. At this point, it is appropriate to quote Justice Ruth Ginsburg, who in her first published legal piece of writing, as a letter to the editor of the Cornell Daily Sun in 1953, wrote on the subject of wiretaps with a stark warning. She stated that wiretapping may save the government investigators a good deal of time and effort by making it unnecessary to seek other sources of proof. A thorough investigation of cases may seem like a burdensome task, especially when the shortcut of wiretapping can achieve more immediate results. As an officer in India once said, it is far pleasanter to sit comfortably in the shade rubbing red pepper into a poor devil's eyes than to go out in the sun hunting the evidence. But even if the situation today demands increased vigilance on part of the government, restraints on individual rights in the field of individual privacy, morality and conscience can be a cure worse than the disease. We may be anxious to reduce crime, but we should remember that in our system of justice, the presumption of innocence is pride and the law cannot apply one rule to Joe who is a good man and another to John who is a hardened criminal. End of quote. Sadly, we have only regressed with time and not heeded the warning of Justice Ginsburg. And this has only become worse with the invasive nature of digital technologies which gather more amounts of our personal data. Even when acting within the law, the police with its broad exemptions under the Code of Criminal Procedure can easily sidestep the need of a warrant. And even when it goes to a magistrate, Magistrates rarely apply their mind in terms of requiring specificity against documents for the purposes of an investigation in a digital storage as opposed to granting the police its request to requisition an entire smartphone, a laptop or a tablet. And these already fragile safeguards are further eroded by subsequent and specific laws which have been made. For instance, look at the Prevention of Money Laundering Act which is called the PMLA or the Income Tax Act then these requirements for warrants are further diluted. Disturbingly, these provisions clash with the right to privacy as well as the protection against self-incrimination, which are under Part 3 and Article 20, Subclause 3 of the Constitution of India. However, these practices continue. These questions have also been raised in the context specifically of press freedom in a petition filed by the Foundation for Media Professionals, 
which is supported by the Internet Freedom Foundation, with whom I am associated. It is asking the Supreme Court to lay down clear guidelines to fill in the gaps in the law, which have become even larger due to digital technologies. These gaps in the law, this fuzzy area and these grays and this lack of certainty only works against individual citizens because it permits the police to do whatever it pleases. And quite often, it also seems that the courts are upholding it. For instance, the Karnataka High Court has disappointingly held in the case of Virender Khanna versus the state of Karnataka that an arrested individual can indeed be coerced to unlock their phone, granting law enforcement ticketed access to their personal data. This not only affects journalists, but seemingly endorses mass searches, stop and frisk tactics currently manifesting as court and searches prominently and repeatedly in Hyderabad. Here, police officers can intrude into a restaurant or stop people on the road, insisting that they unlock their phones and then scan their WhatsApp apps for words such as drugs. There is some hope within the law, for the Karnataka High Court's judgment does not seem to be without challenge. For instance, the CBI Special Court in Delhi's Rouse Avenue has ruled to the contrary. As I stated earlier, the law is in a flux. However, this confusion does not work to our benefit as that is not preventing police authorities from seizing smartphones. These practices largely ignore the Supreme Court's judgment in the K.S. Puttaswamy judgment, where it laid down the fundamental right to privacy and said any interference with it needs to be proportionate, which means that it needs to be in a manner which causes the least invasive impact for fulfilling the lawful purpose. It also ignores the right against self-incrimination. Under Article 20, sub clause 3, compelling people to give evidence against themselves by unlocking their smartphones. By disregarding these fundamental rights, we reach a nebulous and dangerous point in which the democratic guarantees of the Constitution of India itself are under threat. And there are clear ways how this can be addressed. With this, we reach the third and the final part of the video of what needs to be done. Given the enormity of the problem, urgent action is required both at the doctrinal level as well as in terms of enforcement actions, which first requires the Supreme Court to build upon its judgment in K.S. Puttaswamy, where it declared six years ago that privacy is a fundamental right and links to all other fundamental rights under Part 3. Here, its application to the criminal justice system as well as electronic evidence is absent as of date. Here, we need to look at how guidelines may be issued by the Supreme Court of India as was done in the D.K. Basu case. Now, the D.K. Basu guidelines are actually hung in every police station and you may have noticed them and it acts as a safeguard against illegal arrest by letting people know what are their rights. Now, today, for a digital India, the Supreme Court needs to lay down similar guidelines for electronic evidence. What will these guidelines include? These need to fill the gaps between the CRPC, which have crept and become wider due to the advance of technology. And this has been noticed by the Supreme Court of the United States in the noted case of Riley versus State of California, where it stated that cell phones differ both in their quantitative and qualitative senses from other objects, from physical objects which are seized by police departments. This difference comes across quite practically when you just take the news click example, where searches were conducted on at least 46 journalists. This consisted primarily of young freelancers associated with multiple publications. The forceful unlocking of the devices and subsequent cloning of the content uncovers information far beyond the scope of a typical criminal investigation, which means it is disproportionate, which means that the standards in case Potaswamy requiring proportionality are being contravened. Such access lays bare years of their personal and professional communication. It exposes relationships, networks, as well as their confidential sources. Notably, there is a real threat that some of these conversations, particularly those from emails as well as chat applications like WhatsApp, may be leaked, may come on mainstream television and may be used then to incite hysterical national security debates resulting in further criminal prosecution. Here, there are several examples, notably those involving late-night television host Navika Kumar. Here, the entire chain from who is questioned, what is seized, how much is seized, how it is stored needs to be oriented towards the digital age, towards making it more consistent towards the constitutional rights of any person accused of any criminal activity. This needs further safeguards, in fact, for classes such as journalists and lawyers. Now, taking a journalist smartphone isn't just an intrusion because it challenges a powerful government or private sector entities, which may be hypothetical, but it also directly may criticize the investigating agency itself. Let's again take the news click example where the Delhi police is the same enforcement agency on which these journalists have reported. As per news reports, these journalists have been interrogated on three significant events. The anti-farm protests, the Northeast Delhi riots of 2020 and the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
all these three events are not just matters of public interest for you and me, but are also the subject of criminal proceedings initiated by the Delhi police. And as I said, the journalists have gone from reporting on the police to being investigated by the police. Here, the Supreme Court may hear cases before it and issue protective measures such as requiring compulsory warrants, seizure specificity, protection against the forced device unlocks, hash value generation to make sure evidence is not tampered, and also ensure that evidence is not leaked to late night television show hosts who may drum it up to whip up hysteria. To conclude, over 50 years ago, India's Supreme Court ruled that during an emergency proclamation, individuals couldn't challenge illegal detentions. This was the shameful ADM Jabalpur case, and it is a disturbing decision. But it also stands out for providing a courageous dissent by Justice H.R. Kanna, who affirmed our constitutional principles. Later, the court in the Justice K.S. Puttaswamy case both recognized the right to privacy as well as expressly repudiated ADM Jabalpur as a quote unquote discordant note. Yet, even six years post Puttaswamy, its enforcement in matters of informational privacy remains disappointing. Recent repression against journalists from the online news portal news clicks such as raids, seizures, and arrests amplify the calls for protections in a digital age. To speak plainly, it would be reasonable for a young journalist today to question whether the ADM Jabalpur judgment is dead only in letter but is flourishing in spirit. When over ADM Jabalpur, the court also stated that when histories of nations are written and critiqued, they are judicial decisions at the forefront of liberty. Now, where are these judicial decisions? Why are they not forthcoming today? Today, the problem seems to be a judicial avoidance. I also feel that our nation today is not merely passing through a transitory emergency. Emergencies are exceptional circumstances. They start and they end. They are temporary. We are instead witnessing a deeper social and institutional transformation with symptoms of digital authoritarianism. There is a danger it may be permanent and may last. In this difficult time, it is principal journalists who are helping check power and hence maintain our constitutional framework that is under a clever and muscular form of challenge. To quote Justice H.R. Khanda from the Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture titled as Constitution and Civil Liberties, when he was the chairperson of the Law Commission, he stated, It is the freedom to express a view different from that of the ruling party or individual that distinguishes democracy from dictatorship. Regimentation of ideas goes ill with democracy. It is not for those in power to decide as to what view should be propagated amongst or professed by the people. End of quote. Young journalists today require support from the Supreme Court of India to practice these constitutional values. To take the principal lesson of Justice H.R. Khanna's dissent, which is to act with judicial courage at the time it is required, knowing that it may come at personal risk and sacrifice. This is the enduring lesson of ADM Jambalpur. It is not merely the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Thank you so much for watching. This video is based off two op-eds I've authored recently for the Hindu. I've also linked to several references I've made throughout the course of this video. These references provide a deeper understanding and greater detail around this entire issue from criminal law practitioners who have been working on this issue for a long period of time. Let this video only serve as an introduction. Let me not end this video with only prescribing reading. While every other YouTuber may want you to like and subscribe their videos, I will ask you to do something a little much more nefarious. Please consider sharing a link to this video in your colony, RWA, school alumni, or even family WhatsApp group. It will certainly cause some confusion. Irritation may even lead to the best outcome, where the group itself is deleted. So thank you so much for watching Amal Das Talks. Till we meet again, thank you.